You're listening to Payments Innovation, a podcast dedicated to helping business leaders navigate today's global digital economy. Looking to learn about the latest innovations within fintech and payments? You've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. All right, welcome to another episode of the Payments Innovation Podcast. This is your host, Chris D'Antuano from Currency Cloud. And today I'm happy to have Koki Haziotis from founder of uh, Lasagna Tech. Koki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's really good to have you on. And I think timely of uh, a lot of the uh, the fundraising that's <laughs> happening and announced uh, this past week and past couple of months um, within this whole program industry. But uh, I'll just take a step back. And before we get started, if you can, for our listeners, you know, give a background about yourself and then, you know, what, what you're doing over at La- Lasagna Tech. Sure. Uh, yeah. So quick background. Um, I grew up kind of in investment banking uh, on the regulatory side. So worked with tech teams and financial crime teams to kind of build out regulatory programs around those two things in investment banking. Uh, Moved on from there, went to BCG, ran a global fintech research team. Um, From there, I moved with 11FS from London to the US um, and launched our American program. And since I've left there, I am a writer for FinTech Today. I'm the chief of staff at The Block, um, and I am the founder and CEO of Lasagna Tech. Yeah, we're wearing many hats, it seems like, but a uh, yeah. <laughs> lot, lot of, uh, which, is, which is good because it, it, it seems like this, this rebundling of, of FinTech kind of allows you to wear many hats and be able to pr- provide value within that. Um, I guess, could you, could you start off talking about what, what Lasagna Tech is and what you're doing over there to, to bring to market? Sure. Um, so I can't tell you too much about what's going to happen next, but I would advise all listeners to pay a little bit of attention because it might be kind of cool. But uh, so far, what we've been doing is acting kind of as a central point for banking as a service in America. So what that looks like is that we work with brands, uh, infrastructure providers, and banks to help them kind of wrap their heads around this whole thing. Uh, with banks, it's obviously like, how do we become a sponsored bank? How do we get involved? Um, for infrastructure providers, it's like, is this product even close to what we should be aiming for? Um, and then on the brand side, it's like, hey, we need to partner with someone to to launch our amazing new card or mm-hmm. our, our lending product or whatever else. Um, so this is a very partnership-oriented industry. And I kind of think that Lasagna Tech is a great place to be in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, t- totally agree. And um, us at Currency Cloud are trying. To, we it took us a while to get our uh, to, to understand the U.S. market, um, even when we were here and entered it um, to understand the regulatory backbone and and, and the opportunity. Um, so, where I, I guess of, as of today, where even though all all three probably are, are in much demand. Do, do you see like, where is it easier to get started? And then where is it actually like taking more time within specific segments to really understand, you know, how, how to get to market? Yeah, so I think uh, I think getting started, the easiest person to work with is a, a, a new or existing FinTech. Um, first of all, the customer, they know what they want, right? I don't really have to explain to them all the terms. I don't really have to explain to them why the unit economics are important. They mm-hmm. get it. Um, so they're, by far, by far away, like kind of the easiest to work with, as it were. Um, and those come in the door almost every day. Uh, it's insane the amount of demand there is for that service. Um, banks are also scrambling for help, but it's a different culture, right? It's a different mentality. So it's a slower process, but I do think it is a meaningful one. Um, and then the infrastructure providers, I mean, I'm just lucky enough to count most of them as my friends. So that's a text message. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's super fun. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in the past couple of years, or at least, you know, four to five years, you'll see the money being really funneled to the programs uh, to be able to get get to you know, to market and have, have funds to play with. And now I think the past year, you're starting to see that that money get get doubled into that infrastructure play or, or that that banking as a service, those providers there. Um, do you see, I guess, where where that those funds are coming in, do you see less experience on the brand side and kind of letting the banking as a service providers or infrastructure providers really just take take on all of the, the the hard work and the brands do what they do as far as bringing in customers and and you know catering to that user experience? 
Yeah, I think that might be true, but I don't know if I necessarily agree with it as like a long-term thing. Um, right. right now, I mean, the brands are really good at knowing how to make money. That's why they're so big and famous and whatever else and well-loved, right? Um, and they've already done the hard part. They have the customer trust. Um, so they know like how to structure these deals, but it is a matter of their size and their scale. Like if I have 12 people on my team, no, I'm probably not going to spin this up myself. If I'm Walmart, I might. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's a, a lack of experience or, or any kind of naivete, but I do think that there is, um, it is a scale issue ultimately. Yeah. And then I guess speaking on that, um, moving it down to the, to the next opportunity. So you have someone like someone like Green Dot, who's, who's essentially been around for quite some time doing this banking as a service. Um, and there's, there's, there's a few banks that have been, you know, technically been doing banking as a service for quite some time. And then all of a sudden now you have this wave of provider after provider, you know, launching funds and, and every, you know, left and right. Um, I guess it, the, the, the common question that, every, you know, that's, that's out there is, is there enough room for multiple players to play? Um, and then within that, where, where's the opportunity for the banks? I know we've had this discussion previous, but it'd be great for our listeners to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think so. Right now, I think we're we're really at the beginning. As much as it looks like there's crowding, I, I like to refer back to the Gartner hype cycle whenever I see this kind of like this kind of crowding in one place in fintech. I we're really we're really in the hype right now. We're I don't think we're anywhere yet, which I think is the most exciting part, right? And I also think the other thing to remember is we we can talk about banking as a service all you want, you know, but banking as a service has been around since the seventies. We just didn't call it that. Yep. Uh, the first example, obviously being a co-branded credit card with an airline, mm -hmm. uh, which is completely like the airline does nothing. It's just their logo. Right. Um, now we're seeing different variations of that. I definitely think there's a ton of room to play still. Um, but it's almost like we need to look the, the sky to clear for a second before we find those areas where there where there are holes. Um, so yeah, I think as much as we keep hearing about all these different players, there's tons of room. And I think we're talking about 30 banks that are doing that right now. We're talking about 30 banks that are acting as sponsor part as part the sponsor banks. Mm -hmm. Um there are 10,000 banks in America. <laughs> exactly. We yeah. have room. There are 300 and 30 million people, we have room. Um, so there's definitely like a lot of interesting things that are going to happen. And um, I'm of the opinion, and I could be totally wrong. I don't, I don't know, sue me, but I'm of the opinion that um, we're going to see a ton of compression in the community bank sector in the next year or two anyway, um, which is just going to create more room. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a ton of space. Yep. So, so on that, um, I guess what, how, how will the, from your perspective, how will the innovation happen for the community banks? Is it, is it themselves investing, um, you know, directly? Is it them partnering with, you know, different types of cores um, that gets them to be able to be innovative at sense? So like, what's their way to get to market and compete? Um, traditionally, they're not known for their, their most aren't known for their, you know, their tech first environment. Um, right. So I think now is a good time to point out why I love community banks. Uh, community banks give us that part of technology that that is unseen, right? Like you know, Uber created a community mm -hmm. of their customer. Community banks already have that; they know how to do that. Um, so I really see them as like, if all you need is the technology, well, the technology is the easy part um, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's actually going to push the community banks is not the API layer around their core or the brand new core that they invested in or all these different technology tools. I think the thing that really is the, the big push is the mentality. Um, thinking outside of the bank, thinking about things not being so vertically integrated, though that's what you're used to. Um, once you hammer it home that you don't need to build everything yourself, you can partner with various organizations to either build or buy or whatever amalgamation of that that you want, um, the floodgates will open, in my opinion. So a lot of the time I spend talking to banks is about that kind of journey. Like, how can we move from saying, this is what we need to do. Oh, and we have to do it all in house. And of course, to actually, 
you have the funds, you have the connections. All you need is the mentality shift. Mm -hmm. Play with these other kinds of technology. Um, and, and I think that's actually going to be the big, the big hump to get over in the next 18 months. That makes sense. And, and so, and it, and it seems like obviously, you know, their, their mission, at least for community banks is all, all built around that, that community, as you mentioned, and it seems like you kind of have the opposite side when you have, um, you know, these, these, these providers looking to just, you know, dis, disrupt like the whole industry itself. Um, it seems like we're, it's going to pit like some of these programs, at least since there's so many that are, are, are coming out now, they're starting to get more segmented. Um, you, you have really specific you know, challenger banks going to market. Um, do you see like community banks strapping into those as far as becoming segment driven um, in that sense, or is it more regional driven or both in, in your opinion? Yeah, so I actually think that, and I've written about this a number of times. Um, I assume people are sick of hearing it, but I'll say it anyway. Um, <laughs> basically, the way I think the market is going to play out over the next decade or so is we're going to see a lot of niche groups getting services directed at their personal experience. Um, and banking is only going to get more customized. And I think the beauty of the community bank is a partner in this kind of situation is like, hey, we we know how to do community because that's our whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, but that was a community of geography. And now it's all about affinity communities. So um, my favorite one that comes to mind is um, a new neo bank called Daylight. Um, Daylight is uh, a bank for the very specific LGBTQ plus journey, um, which is an entirely like divergent financial experience from the heteronormative experience that most of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of market segmentation, that kind of niche banking is really, really important as we get closer and closer to actually serving our customers. And to be honest, uh, the American problem is not that Chase does a bad job. It's just not because they, they do a pretty good job. Still, mm -hmm. most people are comfortable banking with Chase. We don't need another Chase. What we need is a bank just for us. Um, and the closer we get to that, I think that's that's how the market's going to mature. So we're going to end up with like super small segmented groups that are all banking together in a new kind of community. Yeah, I definitely see it moving that way for sure. Now, when you have the conversations with you know, without giving away your your your, your approach here um, in too too much detail, you know, what are the conversations that you have with banks about that build you know by partner? Um, because, it, you know, to be honest, we have those conversations all the time um, directly with the banks and it becomes, it starts to hit this, this, this roadblock of commitment of, of, you know, moving forward and getting over that hump um, to, to, to decide to partner or decide to buy. And it just kind of says, you know, we're not willing to do either and, and move on. Um, can you talk a little bit about those conversations and how do you get to results um, and yeah. to get buy-in from whatever, you know, which way they choose? Yeah, so um, I'll tell you about a somewhat recent experience. Um, I was working with a bank, wonderful group of people, um, but they couldn't get their act together on this. And to be fair, I do not, this is not meant to be disparaging. Like, this is hard. Uh, so I get it, right? Um, so they brought me in and I was like, hey, I think I found your problem. And the problem was they weren't aligned on a mission. And it was that simple. They had everything. They had everything they needed. Um, they could hire for what they didn't have. Those problems are somewhat easy to fix. Um, the problem they had is that they didn't have a mission. So every time you ask somebody on the team what they were doing this for, they had a different different an answer, like mm -hmm. completely different answer. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I was like, okay, so this is going to be an issue. So that tends to be where I start is like, let's dig into that. Let's really think about it. And I mean, to community bankers to have... A, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, a small girl come in and be like, hi, so this is not right. Uh, it can be a little <laughs> bit challenging. Yeah. And on top of it, to come with them, to come at them with something so soft, because they expect me to come in and be like, the technology is not there. And to be honest, it probably isn't. But mm -hmm. um, this is the first problem to fix if you're going to go anywhere. Um, so yeah, I really fight hard on that. And 
I know it's a little soft and I know it can seem a little like flouncy almost, but it really is extremely important. If you, if your team doesn't know why they're building what they're building and why they're selling what they're selling, then you are nowhere. Yeah, and it'll never become some sort of a straight line to, to get to that finish line. Right. right. Um, and that totally looking at it as a high level, you can definitely see where those roadblocks come into play. Um, based off the of priority, decision-making, personal gain, whatever, all, all of the above, I guess you could say, um, within that. I guess if, it, you know, if the right opportunity is to partner, um, you know, how do you scope up, you know, to lay out the opportunities for the banks to partner? I guess, you know, traditionally you go through this, this ingraining RFP process that really doesn't tell the story to the, to the banks. Um, obviously, you're, 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 I'd assume you're really helpful there to really tell the story rather than do the, you know, the ones and twos or the X's and O's uh, for the providers. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about how, how that works and the journey along that opportunity? Yeah, I, yeah. So when it comes to partnership, uh, I tend to use a pretty maybe crass analogy um, when I do this. Uh, the first thing I say to them is imagine your car was built in the same factory, the entire thing. How much do you think you'd pay for that? And they'd be like, well, you know, that would be so expensive. Why wouldn't you use different parts from different places? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have so, to finish my sentence here. <laughs> exactly. It's like, that's kind of the first thing I say. And they're like, oh, and then we, we end up trying to get it to click. And I use a series of things to kind of go through with them. Um, I have a really stupid example I give all the time, which is uh, you want to build a bench in your yard. Who do you want to use? Um, a master craftsman who's done this his whole life or uh, your neighbor down the street who has trees in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, of course I'd use the master craftsman. And I'm like, yeah. So these guys who are your API plugins who do anything as a service, which is to say like, you know, find a crime as a service or, you know, SARS as a service, anything. They're your master craftsman and you guys are the neighbor with the tree in the yard. And they're always like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, you know, that's what it is. Uh, it's, it's about opening the mind to the, to the option of partnership because it's not, it just isn't the way things have been done. Mm -hmm. And the more we think like that, the more innovation slowly dies. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of push on that point. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And, and obviously they've been working off of technically whatever the core gives them for however so long. Um, right. And the fact that they're, you know, th there's there's other ways of working or new ways of working is, is sort of like opening that, that door slowly. Um, you know, so there's not a stampede that rolls in. Um, do you, Obviously, there's more. I would I would say uh, I wouldn't say advanced, but there's there's more progressive banks uh, that are that are already going down this path, um, and then you have maybe you know slow digital transformers that are eventually coming down. Um, I guess for the thirty that you mentioned, uh, do mm -hmm. you see any banks that are you know, guess so far ahead of the rest that they're starting to take up you know a lot of that market share? Or, or is there just specific banks doing, you know, specific things and that's how they're gaining, you know, the, these programs as end clients? Uh, no, no one's ahead of anyone else. Um, no. What I do think is interesting is that a lot of banks have taken a segment. So one bank will be like, hey, we only really want people with a lot of money um, who only want deposit accounts to be the end customer. And that makes it kind of easy, right? Or there'll be someone else who's like, hey, we only do lending. Mm -hmm. We're not going to offer you a debit account. We only do lending. And I actually think that's kind of smart and interesting because as much as we say we all want to plug and play, we really want a specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the banks are kind of offering us that right now. Yeah, they, they are for sure. Um, and then as we move towards, I guess, the opportunity for the bank to bring, I guess, more opportunity to these programs, is, for example, like an API marketplace, for example, that allows them to be able to plug in and and, and bring more traction and, and opportunity. Um, you know, where does where would that sit within the bank? Is that more of like an, the the innovation team? Is that you know a program management team? Is it uh, kind of this this all of the above to be able to advise programs if they're being advised about to do it as well? You know, 
Yeah, uh, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think it's the right question, but it's not one I have an answer to because it doesn't. Yeah. Right. I, most banks that we're talking about here don't have innovation teams. Right. Um, mm. And if they do, they've been separated out, and it's all about protecting the mothership, and they're like a separate entity technically or whatever else. Um, I've had a series of conversations with a bank where this whole program sits in clients. And I'm like, okay, but I think we're missing something here. <laughs> um, but, you know, it kind of sits differently everywhere. Um, most of the banks I work with, I work directly with their CEO. So that's kind of at least indicative of priority for mm-hmm. the bank. Okay. Yeah. And it, like, and I guess like the, the, the transformation team sort of sits with that innovation team and it's like, you got to do one before you get to, to the other in that sense of, you know, uh, idealism and then trying to f- execute as well at the same time. Yeah. Um, doesn't, doesn't really work that way. Um, I guess, you know, my, my last piece is, and I, we've touched on it, uh, you know, quite a bit here, but um, we're, you know, I believe, and in, in you've said it earlier that we're really at the infancy of, you know, where, where we're going. And I think, um, you know, not to, uh, to, to, you know, put any negativity on my friends over across the pond, but I think we both agree that you know, the Americas are really innovative with fintech, and it's got a different type of narrative. Um, you know, across the board with you know programs maybe starting out uh, in EMEA, um, but you know, could you talk about a little bit about your thoughts on you know America as where we're at in in the fintech landscape and in that progression? Sure. Um, so if we're if we're talking globally, America is kind of like um, the rebellious teenager, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, We are so far behind Asia, it is laughable. Um, We are somewhat in line with Latin America and South America. Um, African FinTech is a whole different beast. uh, And let's not forget to credit them for, Mm -hmm. you know, inventing P2P payments. And uh, European FinTech is in this weird slouch right now. Um, I like where America's at. America is uh, very much in a place of opportunity right now, uh, somewhat living up to its title. Um, I really think there's a, there's a lot there. Um, in terms of innovation, do I think what we're doing is so innovative? No. Do I think we're thinking about fun ways to do it? Yes. Um, I think there's a lot we are doing that can really change how financial services works because lest we forget pretty much anything we do is gonna extrapolate and end up in a diaspora around the world. Um, Cause that's just the nature of our economic prominence as it were. Yeah, so most happen. definitely. <laughs> yeah. And I think just, even, even the opportunity, I mean, even it took me quite some time to figure it out, but um, just the opportunity for that, that bank to sit as the back end sponsor and really just be able to offer their deposits to another layer, whether it's you know this prepaid card program, as you mentioned, um, or just a co-branded type of opportunity, um, you know, that's pretty innovative in, in my opinion. And that's acting like an infrastructure before it's time uh, to be yeah. able to, to play where they know they fit. I mean, as you know, I spent a lot of my career in London. So I was able, and I was in London when, when Monzo and Revolut were coming to their prominence. And of course they're like amazing, right? Monzo, Revolut, Starling, that's the, that's who we look to when we talk about neobanks mm-hmm. um, and their ability to be super effective. Uh, and I remember I was sitting in London. I was like, why isn't this happening in America? Isn't that weird? Like we have way more people. There are a lot of customers to serve. 23% of the population is on underbanked or unbanked. Like this is crazy. Um, and then I came over and I like started digging around and I was like, whoo, this is a mess. We're talking about a whole different problem set. Uh, in Europe, the problem set is just not as dramatic. I guess is the word I'm looking for. Um, in Europe, we we have pretty good infrastructure. You have things like the UK faster payment system. Mm-hmm. You can pay your friends in 12 seconds through your bank account, and then that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, getting money back and forth, not an issue. Um, open banking makes it really easy to share your data with yourself across multiple platforms, not an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, there are special charters from the FCA for fintechs to get up and running. There are special sandboxes from the FCA to help fintechs test things out and play in the special area. Uh, 
we don't have any of that. <laughs> Wish we did. So the problem is that is really different. And I think we have to think realistically about the uh, population being really different. America has the most diverse population in the world. We have people from all over the world. We have immigrants, we have second gen immigrants all the way down. Um, we are insanely diverse with insanely specific set of needs per group. And that group can be like segmented all the way down to being really, really, really specific. So for me, for instance, it would be like New York immigrant, immigrant from Greece, uh, you know, brown curly hair. Like we can segment that down all the way, right? Um, and that would still get us a pretty bulky customer base. In the UK, for instance, that's not going to happen. <laughs> even <laughs> London, even though it's super geographically diverse, it's still majority European, um, people of the same socioeconomic class. Um, we're talking like Monzo and Revolut and Starling, they all have the same customer base. Right. And that customer base is young, somewhat rich. That's it. Mm -hmm. right. Like if we did that in the US, we'd be like, okay, I have a Chase Sapphire, <laughs> now what? Yeah, you got a private banking account at Chase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's a different level of wealth too. Yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know, hits 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 at home the point um, that I was trying to get at, and um, you know, I think again, in, in like you mentioned earlier, like we're we're just getting started here, so that's uh, it, you know, it's exciting uh, to be you know in it on a daily basis, but then also you know to step out of it and see you know the advantages that it's that's happening on a you know on a on a daily basis for the consumer and businesses as the, as the end clients. Um, to change their lifestyle as well. So, well, Koki, it was really you know a pleasure to have you on here today. Um, we'll be sure to share obviously your information for you know customers to get in touch or potential you know partners to get in touch with you. Um, you know, any any last thoughts that you want to bring out um, while I got you here? Um, I got nothing. But <laughs> subscribe to FinTech today. Subscribe to the blog. Um, and make sure to follow me on Twitter. I guess if you like bad jokes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure we could use all of those nowadays too. <laughs> well, Koki, appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This is super fun. Awesome. Take care. Currency Cloud is an online payments company that makes international money transfers fast and simple for businesses. We're building a borderless future where international transactions are seamless for a better user experience. Discover the world's most trusted payment platform and our toolkit of developer-friendly APIs at CurrencyCloud.com. You've been listening to the Payments Innovation Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe now in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening. Until next time.